Welcome to my YouTube channel. We're going to do a quick video today on consequences of wrong theology proper, wrong soteriology, or having wrong ideas about how God saves people because we have wrong ideas about God himself. What is salvation and why does man need it? How does man receive it? These are foundational questions. The Christian faith provides answers. And as Christians, we believe that the Word of God is our rule of faith and obedience. And as such, the Bible contains the answers to the fundamental questions of life. Scripture is the norming a norm, the norma normans. The Bible is the rule that rules them all, the fundamental principle and foundation of theology. Church history, especially as it has produced the creeds and confessions of the church, provides us with a running 2,000-year reflection a group conversation and consensus upon that which Scripture explicitly or implicitly teaches, that is, that which is either expressly set down in Scripture or by good and necessary consequence may be deduced from Scripture, Westminster Confession of Faith 1, 6. Doctrine or theology, then, is formed from what the Scriptures teach. The Scriptures are profitable for doctrine, 2 Timothy 3.16. But the Scriptures, they are not formally doctrine themselves. Scripture contains narrative, poetry, epistle or letter, apocalypse, and other genres of literature. Our doctrine or theology comes from the Bible, but it is not the Bible itself. We often make propositional truth claims about what Scripture teaches without explicitly quoting Scripture all the time. And this is self-evidently necessary. For us to describe what the Scriptures teach requires words and phrases that are not explicitly quotations of Scripture. Consider an example. Johnny asks Susie, what does John the Apostle mean in his gospel when he writes, you must be born again? Susie simply repeats, you must be born again. Johnny replies, yes, but what does that mean? Susie repeats again, you must be born again. Did Susie help Johnny to understand? No, she just simply quoted scripture and provided no explanation. Providing an explanation to Johnny may require Susie to use words like regeneration. Although this exact word regeneration is not found anywhere in John chapter 3. Jesus himself provided an explanation to Nicodemus regarding the meaning of his words, but the chapter never seems to indicate that Nicodemus understood. Surely many other have been many others have been perplexed by the words of Jesus in John chapter 3 even when the full passage is read. It is self-evident that scripture must be interpreted. And a standard church service in which a sermon is delivered by a preacher proves this point. In preaching the word, no man dare simply read scripture verbatim without interpreting its meaning and providing explanation and application to the hearers. Imagine a sermon in which the entire book of Romans is read, and then the minister sits down. Is this what God calls us to? No. Scripture itself proves this much in many examples in which to explain Old Testament passages Men in the New Testament used words not found in those original texts to explain the meaning of those texts. One example will suffice to establish this principle. Acts 8.26-35 through 35. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went, and there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. The spirit said to Philip, Go over and join his, this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this, like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Um, who can describe his generation, for his life is taken away from the earth? And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, does, this pro does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with the scriptures, or this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. Is, is the word Jesus explicitly contained in what we know today as Isaiah chapter 53? No. Was Philip wrong for telling the eunuch the good news about Jesus from this passage then? No. Scripture teaches us here that it would be the non-biblical thing to do for us to refrain from using words foreign to one text 
to explain that particular text's meaning. Remember that Scripture is profitable for doctrine. Scripture is thus a means to an end. Scripture does not exist for its own sake, but it exists so that we may know and glorify the God who speaks in Scripture. This is attested to in the book of John, chapter 20, and verse 30, 31. Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Scripture provides the data from which doctrine and theology are developed. Philip's doctrine of the gospel of Christ is developed from Isaiah 53 and many other passages that mutually shed light on each other. To interpret Isaiah 53 correctly, Philip had to be a theologian. His theology informed his exegesis and his hermeneutics. And I just have some quotes here of what uh, exegesis and hermeneutics uh, consist of. Biblical exegesis is the actual interpretation of the sacred book, the bringing out of its meaning. Hermeneutics is the study and establishment of the principles by which it is to be interpreted. Whereas exegesis refers to the interpretation of a specific biblical text, hermeneutics is deciding which principles we will use in order to interpret the text. Sound interpretation of a biblical passage, exegesis, depends on the exegesis of that particular passage and all other passages and the principles upon which any given passage is to be interpreted, hermeneutics. We believe that Scripture interprets Scripture. This is known as the analogy of faith. And I have this quote from monergism.com. Uh, the analogy of faith is a reformed hermeneutical principle which states that since all Scriptures are harmoniously united with no essential contradictions. Therefore, every proposed interpretation of any passage must be compared with what the other parts of the Bible teach. In other words, the faith or body of doctrine which the scriptures as a whole proclaim will not be contradicted in any way by any passage. Therefore, if two or three different interpretations of a verse are equally possible, any interpretation that contradicts the clear teaching of any other scriptures must be rolled out from the beginning. Through sound hermeneutics and proper exegesis, and by the indwelling teacher himself, God the Holy Spirit, the individual and the collection of individuals, the congregation or assembly of believers, creates doctrine, i.e. theology. And hearing then what your pastor says in a sermon, what another Christian communicates in a conversation on doctrine, or even hearing what a, an unknown Christian on YouTube uh, has to say, this is a great means of reflecting upon the data, the scripture, informing our theological commitments, doctrine. The church of the last 2,000 years serves as another great tool for us to use in understanding the things of God. Through church history, we can see the errors and pitfalls of others as these conversations have occurred. Church history has given us the doctrine of the Trinity, for instance. Certainly, this is a biblical doctrine, but it is a doctrine nonetheless. And recall that our discussion was that doctrine is created as the result of an individual's or collective's reflection upon the data points of Scripture. So what does all this discussion about Scripture and formation of doctrine have to do with the title of our video, which was Getting Soteriology Wrong Because Our Theology Proper is Wrong, or, in the explanatory subtitle, Having Wrong Ideas About How God Saves People Because We Have Wrong Ideas About God Himself. In short, everything. To answer questions about how God saves us, it is necessary to have an understanding of God. If God is the world, or the world is God, as in pantheism, then God, quote-unquote, saves us by us ceasing to be ourselves, letting our illusions of diversity and individuality fade away as we empty ourselves and become the one. It is then when we realize that Atman, the individual self, is Brahman, the cosmic soul or universal reality. If God is a personal being, an essence who is infinite in his perfections, one who transcends the creation as its creator and sovereign sustainer, one upon whom all else depends but himself depends on, no, on none, one who is holy, just, merciful, all-knowing, all-powerful, everywhere present, then our concept of salvation must of necessity be vastly different from that of the pantheist. Much could be said about how our doctrine of God, theology proper, impacts our doctrine of salvation, soteriology. For this video, I just want to consider one example regarding the distinction between Reformed theologians and Armenians, open theists, and others who just haven't thought these things through in a consistent manner. 1. Reformed theology versus others. 
Being quote-unquote reformed entails many things. Certainly it is much more than being Calvinistic or holding to what has been called TULIP, the acronym being a rearranged and simplistic summary of the canons of Dort. While being reformed is much more than these things, it is certainly not less. Meaning anyone who is reformed in the specific context in which it is being used here will at least believe in a particular or definite atonement for God's elect who were chosen unconditionally in eternity past as part of God's eternal decree of all things. This decree of election in time results in our effectual call, preservation and perseverance, all of the ordo salutis, the order of salvation, being the work of God alone, monergism, but occurring in space and time, historia salutis, in the account of the events of Scripture and now in our lives, as once we were depraved in our will, emotions, and intellect, every facet of our being, God, having accomplished redemption for us, applies that redemption to us. Vastly different is the non-reformed view of soteriology. All non-reformed views of salvation involve a synergism, a working together of God and man, to accomplish and apply the salvation that God provides as a possibility for all men. Various formulations of non-reformed thought exist. Different terms have been applied to these formulations, based upon either prominent teachers with that persuasion, such as Arminianism, based on the teachings of Jacobus Arminius, or based upon prominent themes of that doctrinal formation, uh, provisionism and open theism. At the risk of oversimplifying, one can think of these different theological camps according to a gradient or range of beliefs. And I have here just a little figure or a little uh, graph, uh, if you want to call it that, hyper-Calvinist, and then Reformed, Augustinian Calvinism, and then Amoraldians, Molinists, Armenians, Provisionists and semi-Pelagians, Pelagians, open theists, and lastly, process theologians. And what distinguishes the hypers from regular Calvinists, i.e. Christians who hold to the historic Reformed confessions of faith produced in the 16th and 17th centuries? Hyper-Calvinists take the principle that God is sovereign, and they so exaggerate this concept that they leave no room for moral responsibility. It is a kind of fatalism, a what-will-be-will-be attitude. One who says God is going to do what God is going to do and nothing we do matters or changes anything. Someone who says that is a hyper-Calvinist. And ironically, the hyper-Calvinist commits the same error of the Armenians and those beyond Armenius in asserting that God's will and human free will and actions are incompatible. Reformed folks understand that God's sovereignty does not negate human responsibility. There is a compatibility between the two. We see that God decrees all that comes to pass but that this does not logically entail fatalism or a nothing-we-do-that-matters attitude. Two concepts from the Westminster Confession of Faith are helpful here. One, God's decree, rather than removing man's moral responsibility or free will, is that which establishes both. Responsibility and free will, that is. Uh, Westminster Confession of Faith 3.1 From God from all eternity did, by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will, freely and unchangeably ordain whatsoever comes to pass, yet so, as thereby, neither is God the author of sin, nor is violence offered to the will of the creatures, nor is the liberty or contingency of second causes taken away, but rather established. Westminster Confession of Faith 9.1 God has endued the will of man with that natural liberty that it is that is neither forced nor by any absolute necessary necessity of nature determined good or evil. Two, So that was the first concept, uh, that God's decree, rather than removing man's moral responsibility and free will, is that which establishes both. And then two, God uses means, or secondary causes, to accomplish his ends. Three, six, as God has appointed the elect unto glory, so has he, by the eternal and most free purpose of his will, foreordained all the means thereunto. Wherefore, they who are elected, being fallen in Adam, are redeemed by Christ, are effectually called unto faith in Christ by His Spirit, working in due season, are justified, adopted, sanctified, and kept by His power through faith unto salvation. Neither are any other redeemed by Christ, effectually called, justified, adopted, sanctified, and saved, but the elect only. 5.2. Although in relation to the foreknowledge and decree of God, the first cause, all things come to pass immutably and infallibly, yet by the same providence He ordereth them to fall out, according to the nature of second causes, either necessarily, freely, or contingently. 
Five three. God in his ordinary providence maketh use of means, yet is free to work without, above, and against them at his pleasure. Now much could be said regarding these confessional statements and the scriptural support for these claims. These statements are certainly mature Christian reflection upon the date of Scripture and can therefore serve as authoritative doctrinal statements for the church, as is the case for Presbyterians all around the world. For the purpose of this video, I merely highlight the fact that there is an ocean between what has been called hyper-Calvinist and historic, reformed, Augustinian, Pauline Christianity, um, or simply just reformed theology. In short, reformed folks understand that scripture says both, and both there meaning God works all things together if the counsel of his will, and in God commands all men everywhere to repent. So that's Ephesians 1.11 and Acts 17.30. Both of those things the Reformed camp will affirm. To be Reformed means that you accept both of these statements as non-contradictory, compatible, mutually reinforcing truths. Non-Reformed folks must exaggerate one of these claims to the exclusion of the other and maintain a false dilemma i.e. that man cannot have a free and morally responsible will in a world of all things that work after the counsel of God's will. So the non-reformed says that these concepts are mutually exclusive, that they are uh, you cannot have a world in which both God foreordains all that comes to pass and men are morally responsible. The Calvinist says both happens, and the hyper-Calvinist actually agrees with the Arminians and says you're right, um, you know, God foreordains all things in this case, they would take that stand. But they would say that, you know, what man does ultimately doesn't matter. So to the right of Reformed folks range the Amoraldians to the open theists and process theologians and those in between. Open theists would argue that God does not know all things. In response to criticism, they have tempered this claim, arguing that God knows all things quote-unquote knowable and is therefore omniscient. However, they are uh, specifically excluding future events as things which could be known, and therefore, they would say that God does not know the future. This has obvious implications for God's knowledge of the future, uh, contingent decisions of free moral agents. I will restrain from critique at this point and just note that the open theist is a very consistent Arminian. Desiring to maintain the free will of man as incompatible with God's decree, they have inv um, invented a God who does not know the future. While most non-reformed theologians have not embraced open theism and thus not given up the traditional doctrine of omniscience, they have at least embraced an inconsistency, if not another false doctrine. While wanting to maintain that God knows all things, including the future and thus all, many modern Christians have nevertheless invented a God who at one point learned. So while God may at this current time be omniscient, this wasn't always the case. Confronted with scriptures that clearly teach God's election of individuals unto salvation, the non-reformed often resort to something like, quote, God looking through the telescope of time to see who would believe and then electing those individuals, end quote. There are obviously many problems with this view. For one to maintain this view, they must give up several orthodox doctrines under theology proper. Divine aseity is given up because God must depend upon his creation in some way. In this case, his knowledge of all things depends upon what creatures will do in time. Divine eternity or timelessness is given up because God is thought of as experiencing a succession of moments, presumably before looking through the telescope of time to see who would believe to elect individuals to salvation. This election was something that he had not determined to do before the set event of observation through the telescope. Divine immutability is given up because the content of God's knowledge changes once he comes to know who will believe, introducing change into divinity. Most obvious of all, divine omniscience is given up. For if God is truly all-knowing, then, he he, then he always has been all-knowing. It is not as if God knew all future events except who would believe. If God truly comes to know this information regarding who would believe the gospel as information that is independent of his will and determination, then the well-meaning Armenian and provisionist has at least introduced parts, temporality, ignorance, and finitude into God. This is not the God of the Bible. In the Reformed view, God knows all things in himself in one eternal act. His knowledge is dependent upon himself, and not anything outside of himself. The decree of God determines all that comes to pass. Election is determinative of man's destiny. Man's decision is not determinative of God's destiny. Our decisions in time 
do not move God from one state of knowledge to another. To affirm that God's decision of whom to elect depends on his passive foreknowledge of future events involves giving up nearly every orthodox doctrine of theology proper. This video is a short introduction to this assertion, but one which I hope equips you to, to understand the fact that the most important thing we believe is what we believe about God. I hope you see better that all areas of doctrine affect all other areas so that one cannot be consistent and orthodox in one area unless they are orthodox in all areas. Fortunately, most serious Christians have more inconsistencies in their theology than they do heterodoxy. We may call these truly blessed inconsistencies. The open theists and process theologians have embraced consistency at the expense of any semblance of orthodoxy. Let us not follow them there. Let us be both consistent and orthodox, so that we may be orthodox at every point. 2 Peter 1-2 Grace and peace be multiplied unto you, through the knowledge of God and through Jesus our Lord.